Thank you very much, Professor uh, Denise uh, Ragama. I appreciate the introduction. First of all, do you hear me and see me or not yet? Okay, yes, we are hearing you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jacob Asano and Dr. Nani Sisi for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, event and this session to be uh, joined, with, joined, joined with Dr. Ahmed Khalifa and Professor Dugarsi. Let me share my screen. And I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Can it? Yes, we can see it now, please. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay. So, yes, uh, what I'm going to, to do in the next 10 15 minutes is speak about the bigger trends that are shaping the global health landscape and where the best plans I have combined these two uh, questions in one so that you know uh, for the sake of the time. First, the, the first mega trend is the demographic. Population will grow from 8 to 10 billion by 2060, and the age group 65 years and older will be the most growing uh, group, age group, as this chart shows. The light brown is age 55 plus, followed by age 25 to 64. Now, in MENA, between 2020 and 2030, population will increase from 465 million to, four, five, to 540 million, with growing shares of three groups the age, the youth, and urban population. Those over 65 years will increase from 25 million to 40 million, and 10% of them will be suffering from dementia, and this has implications on the health services. Those aged 15 to 20 years, 29 years old, will increase from 160 million to 162 million, with higher per capita of NCD risk factors. The second shift is in the neural. And this will be characterized by the rise of not communicable diseases and pandemics. Globally, NCDs constitute more than two thirds of the global burden of disease, as the red line shows in this chart, mostly among adults. So the second chart it has the green, brown, red, and brown. All these groups above the age of 50 years old will have uh, the most burden of, of NCDs. The second characteristic of the, the neurologic transition is the pandemics. In fact, the pace of disease outbreaks has accelerated from less than 100 per year before 1980 to about 400 annually since 2000. And we've seen many outbreaks and pandemics uh, in the last 20 years. And we've heard, we've heard all these uh, words that came into our lexicon. Pandemic, perma crisis, triple pandemic, uh, pandemic and body crisis. These were all the result of the COVID 19 uh, pandemic. In MENA, NCDs constitute two thirds of the burden of disease, and all MENA countries except for Djibouti have higher than average burden of NCDs for their level of health spending. This chart shows the global burden of disease in all countries. And the trend line is the average. Almost all MENA countries that are depicted with red line, the red dots are above the trend line. In MENA, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, and chronic respiratory diseases accounted for 65% of all deaths, about 1.5 million deaths in 2019. One in five adults will experience premature death, and risk factors of chronic diseases are prevalent particularly tobacco use, unhealthy diet, and physical inactivity with increased rates of overweight and obesity. This chart shows that the region has the highest trend of raised fasting blood glucose. The third is urbanization. 
more than half of the world population live in urban areas and will reach two thirds by 2050. In MENA, the urban population will grow from 306 million to 372 million with increased air pollution and peri-urban slums. And again, this has implications on health services and the health sector. The fourth is technological. Big data, proliferation of applications and innovations will have great impact. However, they are still underutilized. For example, healthcare constitutes more than one third of the global data sphere. All the data that are being produced in all industries, healthcare has 36% of, of the data being produced by the health sector. However, only three to 5% of health data are used to make health decisions. So it's greatly underutilized. The challenges are that financing and governance are inadequate, and also the data flow is fragmented. For example, 39% of applications send data to uh, federal ministries of health or central ministry of health and or their structures. So about 60% of the data do not flow or do not converge into one direction. In MENA, despite varying and uneven levels of digital health maturity around the world, MENA actually fares well on seven different metrics. So this spider chart actually has seven metrics that reflects uh, digital health maturity. And actually MENA, which is represented by the dark blue line, actually fares relatively well compared to Eastern and Southern Africa, Latin America, even South Asia, as well as Western Central Africa region. So uh, we're not in a bad shape. However, there is a lot that can be done. The final and the last challenge or mega trend or shift is in climate change. Increased levels of carbon dioxide, temp temperature, sea levels, and extreme weather events will impact health through seven different exposure pathways. And these are the seven exposure pathways down there. I'm not going to go into the details, but the impact on MENA is huge. For example, this is the temperature projections for MENA compared to the baseline. And as you can see, you know, there will be extreme heat uh, events in the case of uh, climate, uh, in, in, in because of climate change. And this will be reflected in this heat map. Uh, as you can see, this chart or these maps actually show the different levels of heat uh, and exposure to heat uh, based on the level of increase in, in temperature. So this is a nutshell are the major trends and challenges that are faced, we are faced, we are faced with globally as well as in the MENA. Now, what are the policies that are needed to reshape the health sector in MENA? First and foremost is build resilient and integrated health systems that are aware of threats. That would require enhanced and epidemic and crisis preparedness, early detection and reporting rapid and agile uh, in response to evolving needs, absorptive to shocks or of shocks, adaptive to minimize disruptions and able to mitigate and transform after a crisis, and finally use technology such as geospatial analysis and artificial intelligence to track transmissions, events, and monitor response. What I'm going to show you now is a three-tiered investment framework to build such resilient health systems. The base of the pyramid or the base of that system is to have a system that is that aims at risk reduction, prevention, and community preparedness. This is the foundation of the system. Second is detection and containment, uh, detection, containment, and mitigation. And the third level is advanced case management and search response. Each of these have specific actions that need to be undertaken. And there's a document that the World Bank has produced that explains exactly how this can be done with, with country examples. The second priority action in policies is to implement four structural shifts in service delivery, particularly primary health care. 
moving from low quality primary health care for some population, which is very fragmented, to high quality primary health care for all population. From health services fragmentation to integrated people-centered health services, from inequity to fairness and accountability, and from fragility to resilience. What does this mean? That requires three priority reforms. And this is very important in the case of MENA because the first aspect is to build multidisciplinary team, to provide multidisciplinary team-based care. No longer we depend on just doctors or nurses working in silos, but they have to work in, in teams. The second is, and here are examples from different countries, from Turkey, Costa Rica, Costa Rica and Thailand, uh, on how they have done it. The second priority is to build a multi-professional health workforce. It doesn't start with the service delivery. It requires with medical education. In the final years of medical education, nowadays it's important to train the medical professionals in teams. Nurses with doctors, with technicians, paramedics, all of them working in teams rather than working or getting education in, 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 in silos and also embedding education in rural areas, because this will increase the possibility of retaining them in rural areas and in the country as well. Again, different countries have done that have done it differently. And the third is financing public health enabled primary health care. We need to focus more on primary health care and prevention. And while most of our ministries are ministers of health, it's important most of the funding is going to treatment. Right, so it's important really to shift the funding and increase government fund financing to prevention and public health and primary health care with focus on value-based payment models. France and Chile are good examples of that. The third priority actions and policy actions is improve health financing to focus on value for money. Just quick three factoids: global healthcare spending is expected to grow by about 5.54% annually. This is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. It's going to increase from 7.7 .7 trillion in 2017 to about 10 trillion in 2022. Health expenditures will always outpace economic growth, growth. So putting upward pressure on public finance. So if your economy is growing by, let's say, 3%, health spending is going to grow by 4%. 6% is going to be 7 or 8%. So there will be always up, upward pressure to increase funding, to be able to cope with, with increased expectation, proliferation of technology, and increased demand for health services. Also bear in mind that health risks are highly skewed. In fact, across the world, all studies have shown more or less that 10% of population usually consume 60% of the healthcare expenditures. And 30% has no expenditure whatsoever. And these are sort of very young and healthy uh, part of the population. And that requires very smart risk pooling uh, arrangements. For MENA, it is critical to do a number of things. First, increase government financing and expanding, expand the tax base towards universal health coverage. Second, undertake fund consolidation to reduce uh, fragmentation and also to increase risk sharing and cross subsidization to improve efficiency and equity. To transition to innovative provider payment mechanisms like bundling, risk sharing, and capitation. Just paying salaries to health workers has proven to be actually inefficient does not and also does not improve quality. So it's important to shift a little bit more towards more innovative payment models. And finally, increase allocation to prevention and primary care for more value for money. The fourth is to shift the mindset for the use of technology from digitalization to digital enhance. This is in itself requires a different sort of session, uh, standalone session, but quickly. That means you have to, we have to think of digital in service delivery, health workforce management, 
medical education, financing, pandemic preparedness, all aspects of health, the health sector, we need to embed uh, digitalization in it and ensure interoperability. And the last uh, policy priority is to develop health systems that are climate resilient and low carbon emitted. These are the building blocks of health systems. And this is how uh, governments have to focus on building the different uh, health systems blocks in a way that they are climate resistant, resistant and also low carbon emitted. Health sector is probably one of the largest industries that actually emit, uh, uh, I would say, carbon carbon emissions, carbon emissions, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry, I had to, to rush because I have another meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sameh. I'm sure you don't have the time for a couple of questions, but we enjoyed very much your presentation. Uh, just to make a few comments about it, uh, because uh, the MENA region uh, has got very peculiar problems. Uh, it's uh, a number of countries of uh, 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 underdeveloped and developed and uh, developing countries, and uh, there is a rule that uh, it's uh, not right for a developing country to adapt a policy which is running and uh, uh, well going in a developed country. We have to. Uh, not adopt them, but adapt them to uh, our situations. And about the uh, um, a few examples of the community-based education uh, coming from the perspective of a healthcare uh, specialist, uh, the community-based education depends on educating the uh, students in community hospitals, so they get uh, the knowledge from. Uh, the, the, the real fact, and the example is uh, and the, the modern integrated uh, systems uh, which uh, have got uh, early patient exposure from year one in the uh, public uh, health offices and uh, so on. Um, I think we'll go to uh, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Dr. Samah. Sorry for keeping you. Thank you. You are too late. I mean, yeah, I mean, just to comment, I fully agree with you that, you know, the region actually is actually four sub regions. You know, you have high income countries, like the Gulf countries, you have countries in conflict and low income, and you have middle income. And all of these strategies have to be contextualized. You know, this is, there is no one size fits all. And, and that's important to understand the, uh, institutional capacity, regulatory, the regulatory framework, implementation capacity, and then adapt, you know, those, uh, I would say, frameworks or those uh, uh, policies to, to suit uh, each country. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you.